Hello, everyone. Most of you know me. I am Connie Tell, the director and curator uh, for the Center for Women in the Arts and Humanities. Please silence your cell phones. I know I don't have to say that to this crowd, but it can't hurt. On your seats are some evaluation forms. We would really appreciate if you could fill them out. You don't even have to sign them. Just uh, give us your feedback. We want to know how you enjoy our programs. And also, uh, we need them for our funder so we can write really good reports. So before we begin the program, I'd like to thank uh, our funders and everyone who so generously supports this program and all of our programs. Um, the Estelle Leibowitz Memorial Fund, New Jersey State Council on the Arts, Douglas Residential College, Dean Jacqueline Litt, the Office of the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, with special thanks to Barbara Lee and Isabel Nazario, Associate Vice President for, the, excuse me, for Strategic Initiatives and PSE&G for, uh, for their support of the Douglas 100 celebration. I want to recognize Rutgers University Libraries, our partners in presenting the Dana Women Artist Series and the Estelle Leibowitz Endowed Visiting Artist Exhibitions and Lectures. So we're very fortunate to have many Rutgers co-sponsors, uh, people who uh, help us in so many ways, and I'm not going to mention them individually, but they're all listed on the screen. And I want to acknowledge our staff. There goes Nicole Inazelli, the awesome Nicole Inazelli, the manager of programs and exhibitions, Liana Passamano, our program coordinator, Deborah Lee, our student assistant. Raise your hand. She's been with us. This is her fourth year with us. And volunteer Pam Hernandez and Joe Nanashi, who is our uh, videographer for the evening. Douglas Residential College formerly Douglas College, was founded in 1918 as the New Jersey College for Women. This is a special year for Douglas and for Rutgers, the only flagship public research university in the nation to offer students the opportunity to join a women's residential college. This year, Douglas celebrates 100 years of educating, inspiring young college women to think critically and creatively, to work hard, aim high, and carry their sisters up with them. I, for one, would like to repeat college so that I could be a Douglas woman, too. Um, our relationship with Douglas is long and rich. The Women Artist Series, now the Mary H. Dana Women Artist Series, was founded in 1971 by Douglas graduate artist Joan Snyder here in the Mabel Smith Douglas Library. Thanks to the extraordinary and trailblazing efforts of several curator librarians, the Dana Series thrives as the longest continuously running exhibition space in the United States, dedicated to the work of women artists. I would like to point out that one of those librarians, Ferris Olin, uh, a founding director of our center, is also a Douglas graduate. The center's Estelle Leibowitz Endowed Visiting Artist Program was established in 1999 to bring to the university community the work and ideas of exceptional women artists through solo exhibitions, lectures, and short campus residencies. We're delighted to have Mamie Smith continue that legacy with her exhibit in the Mary H. Dean Women Artist Series galleries and to hear, her, to hear her speak about her work tonight. The Leibowitz Endowed Artist not only exhibits her work on the Douglas campus and lectures in this library, but central to her campus visit is the opportunity to meet with Douglas students. Uh, pardon me. As the student artists, such as the student artists from the Women in Creativity House, which is part of the Douglas Global Village. The Leibowitz artist also meets with the IWL leadership scholars, pardon me, the Institute for Women's Leadership scholars, most of whom are Douglas students. After viewing, after viewing the exhibit, they meet with our Leibowitz artist during their class time with Professor Charlotte Bunch and for an informal discussion to learn about the artist's life and work. Uh, we met with uh, the group today and it was really, really wonderful. Uh, for the artist, it's a wonderful opportunity to meet with some very smart and engaged young women. For the past three years, the center has worked with the instructor and students from the Creativity House, as we refer to it, to mount a professional level exhibition in the Dana Galleries of the work produced in the Creativity House year-long exhibition, pardon me, year-long course. Thanks to the IWL Leadership Scholars Internship Program, we've had the pleasure of working each year with a Douglas student who serves as curator of this exhibit and produces a catalog of the show uh, that's published on our website and includes a catalog essay that's written by the student. 
So we're delighted to welcome back these young women this spring. They will have an exhibition in the galleries. I'm honored to have worked with Mimi Smith to bring her beautiful, intelligent, original work to the Dana Galleries as the Estelle Leibowitz Endowed Visiting Artist. Now I'd like to bring Isabel Nazario up to the podium, the Associate VP for Strategic Initiatives. Thank you. Oh, I need a step here. Yes, without Connie at the helm here, we would have all these extraordinary programs at the, our center, so thank you, Connie. Um, so greetings, it's, a, it's really good to have all of you here today on behalf of um, Barbara Lee, our senior uh, vice president, couldn't be here this evening. Um, I thought I'd gladly um, honored to introduce Jacqueline Licht, our uh, dean. Uh, I extend a warm greeting to uh, Mimi Smith, a leading visionary in feminist and conceptual art, so welcome. Uh, as Connie noted, today's program is a tribute to Mimi Smith, but it's also one of the programs at Rutgers commemorating the 100th anniversary of Douglas. In its 100-year history, Douglas has had nine great women leaders as deans, now serving its 10th uh, um, um, its 10th dean is here and, and is among our most distinguished leaders at, uh, at Douglas, Jacqueline. She has a distinguished record of scholarship, teaching, and administrative service that focuses on women's issues. She is professor of sociology and women's and gender studies at Rutgers, New Brunswick. Dean Litt has particular expertise in advancing women at STEM, in STEM and was a principal investigator and consultant for the advanced program at the National Science Foundation. Her leadership in this area continues here at Rutgers as supervising leader of the Douglas Project for Rutgers Women in STEM. She has published articles on STEM and also authored two books, including one that, she, that was a co-authorship focusing on women's global dimensions of gender and care work and is currently documenting the strategies of survival among women of Katrina, the flood disaster in New Orleans. I had the privilege last year as co-chair of the committee to advance our common purposes at Rutgers to select Dean Litt to receive the Leaders and Faculty Diversity Award, a really extremely high award of the of the, that's university-wide. So it was faculty from all of the campuses that selected her uh, to receive this award. She was also honored in 2016 with a joint legislative resolution from the Senate and General Assembly of the State of New Jersey in recognition of her leadership of Douglas, of Douglas College and for her research on women's issues that have made a positive impact on the lives of women and children. So please welcome Dean Jacqueline Litt. Good evening, and thank you, Isabel. Uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm thrilled to be here, uh, thrilled to be introducing uh, one of our most distinguished alums from Rutgers. Um, let me thank Connie Tell first um, for her, yes, we should give her a round of applause uh, for her incredible stewardship of uh, feminist art at, at Rutgers and for her very generous uh, support of Douglas students. So uh, on behalf of the college and our students, thank you, Connie. Before I get into in introducing Mimi Smith, I want to just tell you that there is an exhibit in here and outside that's part of the 100th anniversary. Uh, a professor in sociology, Karen Cerullo, interviewed a number of women to talk about um, what they know now and wish they knew then. So if you want to look, Governor Whitman is here, if you want to look around and, and see messages from women about persistence and resilience, um, I, 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 um, I think you'll really enjoy it. So uh, as 
as Connie said, and um, Vice President Nazario, we're celebrating, Douglas is celebrating its centennial anniversary. And Connie came to me and said, what can we do um, to help you celebrate? And we um, were very excited and decided immediately that bringing Mimi Smith back to campus would be one of the best things that we could do. So we're very, very excited that she's here. So let me tell you about her. Mimi Smith graduated with her MFA from the Visual Arts Department at Rutgers in 1966. This is before Mason Gross existed. The MFA program was located in Recitation Hall, which is now uh, the Ruth Adams Building, that way, down the hill, uh, which now houses um, academic programs. Oh, thanks. Oh, that's, there you go. That's the Ruth Adams building. Yeah. And do you remember that building, Mimi? It didn't look anything like that. Oh. <laughs> it did look like what the building looked like in the back, which is kind of a dump and kind of uh, <laughs> Well. We went in the back Right, that, that didn't exist, right? You didn't go in the front. As a student here in the 60s, Smith studied with fluxus and conceptual artists such as Robert Watts and sculptor Robert Morris. In the atmosphere of anything goes, Smith began making sculpture in the form of clothing, not as garments to be worn, but as sculpture and visual objects. Smith, uh, for her MFA thesis, Smith created the installation Wedding, which was a plastic room with no entry, containing a wedding gown, complete with accompanying train, veil, and bouquet, all constructed in plastics, fabric, carpeting, and paper doilies. Although the feminist art movement had only just begun to take form, this work, along with model dress, recycled coat, and steel wool peignoir, pen, began Smith's journey as an important artist creating work from a feminist view. Though, as she reminded me, that word was not in popular use at that time. As a pioneering artist, Smith was among the first to reject the detached approach of the minimalist artists and make artwork that incorporated her personal life, commenting on the realities of domestic and marital life, pregnancy, and motherhood. These were subjects not talked about in the late 60s by serious artists, let alone the focus of serious work. And we were just talking about she was really a precursor to what happened in feminist scholarship um, as it grew and developed in the late 60s and 70s, which also took a focus on the personal and the everyday and exposed that for its important and its structures of power. So it's wonderful to, um, to locate Mimi in that tradition, for, for me anyway, as a sociologist. Using non-traditional art materials, Smith's work explores the often dichotomous relationship between her everyday life, the trappings of femininity, illness and aging, intimacy, safety and anxiety, current events and time. Her various bodies of work include clothing made from plastic, steel wool and rubber, traditionally rendered drawings, drawings made from knotted thread and tape measures, clocks, artist books and knitted sculptures. During her 50-year career as an artist, Smith's work has been both misinterpreted as fashion and highly respected as critical observations on women's roles. Her work is conceptually clever and materially deeply satisfying to engage. Mimi has been the recipient of numerous grants from the New York Foundation of the Arts, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the New York State Council on the Arts, the National Endowment for, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Mimi has written, been written about in over 75 publications, including Art in America, Art News, Art Forum, Freeze, The New York Times, and several books. She has shown her work extensively throughout the US and internationally in locations such as the Bronx Museum, MOCA Los Angeles, Walker Arts Center, Franklin Furness, the Newark Museum, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, the Hay Haywood Gallery, London, and many more. Her work is included in public collections such as the Getty Center, the Fogg Art Museum, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Tokyo, 
and the Museum of Modern Art. So it is my deep honor to introduce Mimi Smith. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, before I say anything, I want to thank Connie, Nick, and Lay for everything they did to make this show possible, this week possible, and to make it so pleasant for me. Um, I also want to say I'm happy to be back on the Rutgers Douglas campus. I haven't been here, well, I know it's the 100th anniversary of Douglas, and I was not here 100 years ago, but I was here over 50 years ago as a young graduate student, and I'm really happy to be here now, because I honestly feel that my going to, work to Douglas and in the art department that I was in at the time changed, my, changed me from being a painter to doing what I did. Um, anyways, let me start. That's the building. <clears throat> in 19, <clears throat> I'll start from the very beginning. Um, I was born in 1942, just out inside of Boston, and I grew up in Milton, Massachusetts, ordinary childhood. Um, but one of the things I always loved to do as a child was I loved to draw. And it was for that reason that I decided I wanted to go to art school. I went to Mass College of Art from 1959 to 1963. And at the time, Mass College of Art was a, a conventional art school of the period. I, we learned every single kind of medium and how to make it uh, from the usual fine arts mediums, painting, drawing, watercolor to uh, commercial lettering, fashion illustration, um, you name it, architectural rendering. Uh, the school was started as really an educational college, and it's the only state art school in the country. But um, I, to the unhappiness of my parents, decided to major in fine art. And when I came out of mass art, I was a painter, or so I thought. Um, I actually loved painting, and I loved drawing, and I really and truly loved every single thing I ever did at Mass Art. I loved anything I could do with, by my hands and with making things on paper and everything else. Um, while, when I was a junior in Mass Art, I, I met a boy, and he lived in New York. He was from Boston, and in my senior year, I went to visit him all the time. And the day after the last day of classes I had in Mass Art, I decided to come to New York to be an artist. Whatever that meant, I didn't have a clue. I moved in with him, which was scandalous at the time, and amazingly, I'm still living with him 55 years. Two kids, two grandchildren later. Um, I, the first summer, I had a whole bunch of horrendous jobs. I was doing these gigantic abstract paintings in our little tiny 8 by 20 foot apartment in the East Village. And after these bad jobs, he finally said to me one day, he was a graduate student, math in NYU, he said, why don't you just go to graduate school? And I thought, what a great idea. This will keep me out of trouble for two years and give me a chance to work on my painting. I knew someone that had come to Rutgers from Mass Art, actually, and this is how things have changed. It was August, and I called up the department and said, I'd like to go to graduate school. And they said, can you get together a portfolio? Can you bring me letters? I said, yes. And they said, come in. I came in, did it, and I was in for September. So I started in 1963. Um, the first year I started, I was mainly doing paintings. I studied with, with Ulfert Wilkie. I got sick the second semester, had to drop out. I came back in 64. And by now, I was doing these big, large, abstract paintings, like the guys, and I decided I wanted to make big sculptural objects around them. So I thought, what better thing to do than take a class in sculpture? I started with Bob Watts, not knowing a thing about Fluxus, what it was, or anything about Bob Watts, for that matter. Um, so the first week I was there, I asked him if we could learn welding. And Bob Watts said to me, nobody does welding anymore. And I begged him, please, can I do welding? He said, everyone says it's OK, we can do it. And I, I got everyone to say yes. We all stood around the table and put on the goggles. He lit up the torch, 
and I fainted dead away. <laughs> so much for being one of the big guys. I begged him to let me try it again. The same thing happened. And he said to me, I think you should take up soldering, which I did. And I made a piece, which you'll see at the end, uh, at the end of the, uh, the slides. I still call them slides, um, which is a, a photo from what I made. I made these, I, I soldered these pieces of wire together. I sewed canvas and fabric on them, and I painted them different colors. I took them, I connected them with jewelry chain, and I took them and hung them on the roof of my East Village apartment, and I thought of them as jewelry for the city, or even earrings for the city. And I went back and I told Bob about it, and he looked at it, and actually what he said was, this is nothing more than a cleaned up cap row. <laughs> so I said, well, anyways, I knew how to sew, I liked to sew, my grandmother had taught me how to sew when I was about 12 or 13. And I thought, uh, I said, well, I'd really like to make clothes. And he said, make clothes. I was kind of amazed after coming from this conventional academic art school, but you could make almost anything you wanted to make at Rutgers. You could do anything you wanted to make. And I began to realize you could make art about anything very quickly. So I started to make the clothes. The original clothes I kind of thought of, they were plastic dresses, and there's one, again, in, in the picture from uh, at the end. I thought of myself as like the armature for sculpture, and I was surrounded by the plastic. I had this theory that I, I was kind of noticing the way young women and even older women looked at clothes, and they kind of looked at it almost like I, I, I thought the way I had been taught to look at art as a visual object. And I thought if I could make sculpture in the form of clothing, I could say something about my life as a young girl growing up in the United States, and particularly about the common experiences I shared with all the other young girls. So I started to make clothes. Um, this is one of the early pieces I made, and that's me wearing it, from 1965. It's the first recycled coat I made. I didn't really call it a recycled coat, but it was a coat from things I had around the kitchen, and you can see the old Scott towel wrappers. The next pieces I made were one step further. I decided to actually forget about me and just make the clothes as a visual object so that they would just be something that you look, looked at, and it, they wouldn't be clothes. They would truly be sculptural objects. You can see I was a young girl, and I was obsessed with body image. What else? <laughs> Um, this model dress and bikini from 1965. I, I actually threw out a lot of these things after they were kind of getting a little, the plastic was getting a little slimy. And every time I'd explain my little theory, people just laughed. And I was getting tired that they were falling apart, so I threw them out. I remade them for um, a retrospective I had at the ICA in Philadelphia in 1994. This is my MFA thesis show. Um, of all the articles of clothes and all the rituals that a young girl did, and, and when I was growing up, girls got married a lot younger than they do now, and I myself got married at 21. Uh, the most important one really was the wedding, I felt. I did get married in City Hall, but um, much to my mother's unhappiness. But, um, so I decided to make a wedding installation for my MFA show. I made, um, I thought of it almost like a photo album of a wedding. It was a big plastic box and you could look from the outside, you couldn't go inside. And I made a wedding gown out of clear plastic. It had a 30 foot train made out of carpet runners and um, kind of symbolic. And it was on a dress form. And the picture on the right is what it looked like from the outside. And the one on the inside is what it looked like from the inside, and it's all on a white satin carpet. After working with plastic, I started to work with other things around the house. This is my steel wool peignoir. It's probably my most uh, well-known piece, although I actually have to say I didn't show it for years. The first time I showed it was in this very building, in fact. I had one of those uh, women artist shows, Joan Snyder shows, I used to call them, um, in the late 70s. And at the time, I was doing drawings, television news drawings. 
And I decided to show some of my old clothing pieces also at the same time. And I showed, um, I hung, in fact, I hung these on, it was kind of like that kind of a wooden wall. Uh, I hung the, uh, the maternity dress, the girdle, and the peignoir. And I hung the, the wedding train. It was in the middle of a stairway that had rocks on the ground. And I just hung it hanging down from the stairway. And, and in the library on the walls, I had my television news drawings. This is maternity dress. I made it um, when I wasn't, I don't think I was quite pregnant when I started to make it, but I was pregnant very shortly thereafter. And at the time, I had to buy maternity clothes, and they were pretty horrific. In those days, you'd wear like a big tent trying to conceal the fact you were pregnant, not like now. And I also thought how great it would be if you could watch the baby grow. I have an interesting story about this piece. This piece was in a show at the Hayward Gallery called Addressing the Century, and it was all about um, artists and fashion people that make clothes. And um, then it went to a travel museum, one of the Kunst museums in Germany, I think it was in Wolfboro or something. And a woman uh, saw the piece, and I had said how I thought how great it would be to be able to see the baby grow. So many years later, she called me, and she was the editor of the German Midwife magazine. <laughs> and I thought, well, some people get art for them. I get the German Midwife magazine. <laughs> and she said she just loved what I was doing because essentially I was talking about ultrasounds. <laughs> And she was writing an article on ultrasound and wanted to know if she could use my maternity dress to illustrate it. <laughs> These pieces are now in um, nice museums, as you can see. But I really didn't show them for 30 years. Lucy Lepard had seen um, some of them in my studio, as did Mimi Shapiro in the late 70s. And they started to show slides of them when they went around the country talking about um, different feminist art. And that was how they, they got known, actually. Um, I didn't know the word feminism, as was said before. I had never heard of the word feminism. Um, when I made the work, I didn't, wouldn't have even known if it had existed, for that matter. But certainly the work was feminist, as it turned out. And um, so it goes. This is Girdle. When I was a young girl, my mother had a giant girdle. We were talking about this yesterday, I think, in one of the classes. And I was terrified of the damn thing. It always lo was lying on the bed, and I was afraid I would have to wear it. And I was not really very big. I was kind of like this. But even I got a panty girl to hold up my stockings when I was 12 years old, which all girls got. So I decided to make um, my own girdle. And it's made out of, as you can see, rubber-made bath mats that have suction cups. This is actually almost one of my favorite pieces, and I rarely show it. it. I called it a drawing of a dress, and this was my favorite dress at the time. It's made out of thread and a zipper. My, uh, my toast to minimalism. <laughs> In 1968, I was pregnant again, and I noticed all the girls in the park were sitting there um, knitting, and I thought it was just like almost knitting yourself a baby, and how great it would be if you could knit a baby instead of have one the usual way. <laughs> so I decided to make a conceptual art piece. Um, at that time, they sold things called knitting kits, and you would buy a bag that had, say, like three balls of yarn and instructions, and you could, and instructions to make a sweater or something. So I decided to make your own baby kit. and. I, as I was knitting, my, my mother actually helped me with the size of it. Um, this was the size of my son when he was born. The head's a little bigger, but um, it didn't feel that way, let me tell you. And he was, um, and so I decided to knit this, and as I was knitting it, to go along and just write it all down so anyone, including a man, could knit their own baby. Unfortunately, I had a miscarriage. So on the um, undershirt, I wrote, the baby is dead. And one of the interesting things about this piece is in the 70s, when I first started to show it, I never didn't 
finished. I think the first time I ever showed it actually was here in the library again. Um, women thought that I was making a statement that motherhood was dead, which I thought was kind of interesting because it couldn't have been farther from the truth. It was an interesting one, feminism of the day. This is Candy Bra, and no matter what people think, it really was based on breastfeeding. <laughs> I decided to make something for a man, and I don't know what that was based on. <laughs> Tootsie Roll jock strap. It's a medium. <laughs> in 1972, I found myself in Cleveland, Ohio, with two small children. My husband got a new job. And I was in this big house surrounded by appliances, um, two little kids, and lots of furniture. So I decided to make a process art piece using what I thought was the process of my life, which was being repetitive, machine-like, um, to draw the particular works. And I went around and measured all the stuff in my house, and I made these life-size drawings of everything. This is the kitchen. And you can see they were all made up of tiny little knots. And I felt that the tying of the knots was just like my life. I had, was doing the same thing over and over again. This is the bedroom. and I. Um, I, since I was measuring everything, I decided to use the tape measures for some of the drawing lines because they also were repetitive with the numbers over and over again. You can see the detail. The living room. The stairs. This one and the next one were in the um, wax show. I don't know if anyone saw that. While I was making those drawings, I was also making drawings on paper to try and figure out where the perspective should go and how big I should make all the knotted strings and everything. And the drawings on paper, they looked like the little knotted lines. They were sort of like squiggly little lines. Then I started to make drawings that had words in them, actually, instead of squiggly little lines. This is one of the early installations I made um, using words. And I also, this is also the first piece I, what does that say? No, oh, this is, um, did I touch something? This is the first, also the first piece I, I made um, with audio, and um, one of the early pieces again about evolution, not evolution, the environment, pollution. <laughs> uh, these are drawings with words, and they're the, in Soho, in the lofts, I was living in a loft now in Soho, um, almost all the windows are the same size. They're four feet by eight feet. So I decided to make drawings of the windows and hang them on their windows. The ones on paper are just like my windows. The open one says, please close the window, I'm freezing cold. The closed one says, please open the window, I'm going to faint. And the other three say, don't go outside, it's dirty outside. Don't go outside, it's noisy outside. And I was talking to my children. Um, and the audio, I, I read each single drawing into the audio tapes, and people could play them at will. So sometimes I'd come into the gallery and they'd all be playing, sometimes none of them, sometimes one of them. These are some of the other little drawings I made. I actually, um, these small drawings were once made into a mail art show that Barbara Moore did as postcards, and she would send one out every month. There were six of them that she did. And then I kind of settled in on television. I felt that the news was too much in my life. I've said this before about three times already while I've been here, but. Um, I can't imagine in today's world that I thought this in the 70s, honestly. Uh, but I felt that the news was invading my own personal life so that the world outside was coming into my house. Mm -hmm. And I started to take notes while watching the news. And I have like a huge stack of notebooks um, of the news. And I made drawings out of the news. And some of the drawings are straight news. Others are uh, phrases I either heard from the news or phrases I might want to say to the news or things I was doing in my own life that were my own news. And then I read them back into a tape recorder. Some of them had one track, some had two tracks, some had three tracks. That was an installation from 
55 Mercer, by the way. And this is one of the drawings just of the news. And you can see the date, and it was the news at noon. This one says what I wanted to say, shut up. And it was also a word I used to say sometimes around the house. <laughs> in, uh, in 78, I got an NEA grant and bought myself a color television. And I started doing color television news. And I added actually uh, another track to the, to the tapes. And I, I would, uh, the words were the predominant color in each news item story. And so I had a, a four track. This is a detail. And I have noticed, I w I've been um, archiving my work with the help of the Joan Mitchell Foundation for the last number of years. And I noticed that the news really hasn't changed very much. Same stories over and over again, if you read it. This is um, a simple one. Good night. An installation I did at PS1. Uh, a room installation I made for the show sounded PS1. And the middle drawing is, um, it was the anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb and the world's largest oil slick at the time. And so I, the other drawings said, uh, one of them said, please pay attention, no daydreaming allowed. And I thought that would have been a thing to say when I was at school. And the other one had phrases from um, educational TV. The little desk had words written on it, which I don't know if I have a slide. That looked like penmanship. No. This is the show at Franklin Furness. And it's a piece I made called Television News One Day. It's a large artist book. And the f page on the left is the morning news, then the afternoon news, and the night news. And the other track had my news. So at the beginning of the day, I would say, good morning, it's October 25th. And I would read the news. And in the background, I would say, get up, eat your breakfast, please get up, things like that. By nighttime, I was saying, good night, good dreams, go to sleep. These are things I would say to my children. I did a couple of performances at the same time that were readings of my drawings. This one, just amazingly, was videotaped by the Franklin Furnace. Um, and, and, and they decided to put it on one of the early cable art station things. So I was very happy about that. And I was happy because now I have it, because I never would have had a record of it. Um, I didn't do too many of them, although I kept getting asked to do more. I was positively terrified doing them. I had awful stage fright. I should have just done the videos, actually, afterwards. <coughs> That, the other one said, uh, in the background, it said, relax, shut up, get up, and things on the tapes. This one, again, it was like um, talking to my children. It was a news broadcast that had a lot of fighting and war going on. And I, one of the tracks kept saying, just sit right down and stop that fighting, which was something I said a lot in the house. I used to do them. Um, I would read one day's news, and I would have, I'd always only do the performances during news hour. And I would have another day's news on the television screen, but it was silent. And I was, as I said, I was very nervous about doing these. And in order to try them out, I would use my kids as an audience, figuring if they could sit through it, anyone could sit through it. And I discovered as long as I had the television on, <laughs> nobody would look at me, and they could all, everyone would sit through it. And I was very happy, but still, I stopped doing them pretty shortly thereafter. This is. Um, this is a short excerpt from the quiet. I don't know if you can hear it. Well, I should probably. It goes on for a while. 
It's in the other room. <laughs> this is one of the, um, I started to make these large house drawings and they had drawings inside them that had uh, various, they, they were about various things. Most of them were about pollution actually. And I felt that we all live in these very fragile houses where we can't protect ourselves from the pollution. It just seeps through the doors. In this particular piece, the wind, there were two windows in the house, on the front of the house and on the back of the house. One of the drawings on the front of the house was about, uh, it was the words from a documentary on Channel 13, which is the educational PBS channel, about people getting sick in their house from pollution. Um, and the one in the back was about Three Mile Island. And people, it was just excerpts from a news broadcast where people kept saying, we didn't know what to do, we just grabbed the kids and ran. So there were these three track tapes. One had this, um, basically this documentary. One had people saying over and over again, we didn't know what to do, we grabbed the kids and ran. And the third one had, as you can see at the little detail, all the lines in the house were made by me writing over and over again things like, please get your pollution away from our house and we don't want oil slicks near our house and keep those toxins away from our house and other wording over like that over and over again all around the house. This is another one called Home Sweet Home and very similar. It has a lot of pollution and problems in New Jersey actually. Hmm. An installation I did under the Triborough Bridge um, called Dirty Air and they're drawings on canvas and they say over and over again things like dirty air, help, I can't breathe. This was an installation I did at Chase Manhattan Bank, part of a large show, uh, not that large, there were four artists in it, called um, Art Lobby. And it was put together by Jackie Apple in various commercial bank buildings downtown. Um, it was actually a great idea, but it had a lot of problems associated with it. I'll talk quickly. This is about public art. It doesn't quite work out. We were asked to, we were asked by the man who was in charge of purchasing art in these buildings to make pieces, and he wanted them to be about money. So we all made, it was me, Peter Fend, Lauren Ewing, and Jenny Holzer. Now, just listening about those three people, you know this is not going to be something that the banks are going to like. And sure enough, they didn't. As soon as it got up, there were trouble. Um, mine, I had an audio tape. Mine was about um, kids losing their Medicaid cards in Reagan because of Reaganomics. Sound familiar? Um, and in the background, I had, I had gone around downtown and I picked up phrases from people where people were talking about money and how it affected them. So all the phrases in the background of this news account said things like, one of them was, money, 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 I need more money. And the other one said, my husband said, you, you work for the landlord. And just kind of phrases like that. So I first at the very beginning had the speakers on the corners um, broadcasting all this stuff. It was very quiet. I didn't want it to be loud. This was the time when Richard Serra's thing had caused such a ruckus right before this. So I wanted it to be just very quiet, like the sound and basically of people talking, but I didn't count on the architecture of the bank reverberating this throughout the whole bank. So within a few minutes, they asked me to please take the sound on. I had to put everything on headphones. Then they decided they didn't like what this one said. Um, this one had phrases from the stock exchange, which I thought were pretty benign, but I probably didn't even know what they meant. So they made me ex exchange this one with the one that said, my husband said, you, you work for the landlord. <laughs> then the day before the last day of the show, there was a big explosion down on Wall Street and uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, the Merrill Lynch building, and lots of other buildings got blown up. It was by the Puerto Rican Liberation Group. And my work got blown up, and that's my work on the cover of the Daily News. It also ended up being another kind of crazy story that went on for eight years. After lots of uh, friends trying to talk me into it, I finally decided to, ch to um, sue Chase Manhattan Bank, foolishly. 
And the case was Minnie Smith versus Chase Manhattan Bank of North America. <laughs> if you can believe it. Guessing one. Um, at first, I thought I would just ask for a little bit of money, but the lawyer said, no, well, you should just ask for 25000 which is the amount, you know, for, I forget, it was like in civil, a civil court case. And even that, um, I had a gallery dealer I know who knew my work, said, so, well, that would be about right because of these six large paintings. And, and they were see-through, they were on silk, and I wanted it to be like that. I didn't want it to be like the Richard Serra thing. I wanted it to be so light could come into the lobby while people were walking around the lobby. And I've kind of thought of them as stained glass windows almost uh, for the bank. Anyways, for years this lawsuit went on. It was just a nightmare for me. <clears throat> and um, in the process, I started to get a lot of publicity. I got an article in, in the Wall Street Journal. I got an article in New York Newsday. I got something in Art in America. And finally, one day, with the help of my sister, who was a journalist, um, I got an article on the front page of the New York Law Journal. The next day, they settled. <laughs> but even that, they came back to me. I would have settled for nothing by then. This had gone on for eight years. Um, even that, they came back to me and said, well, $25,000, if you sold this in a gallery, you'd only get 12500 so that's all we're giving you. <laughs> but I, I didn't care. I wanted to be done with it. When the check finally came, I figured, you know, it was from Chase Manhattan Bank. It wasn't. It was from their insurance company. And in the whole eight years, what this case hinged on was us trying to find out whether they had insurance, and they said they didn't. <laughs> I started to write these Dear Art Diaries in the 70s. They're little, tiny, for the most part, books. A lot of the writing is calligraphic, so you can't really read it. And I thought to myself, here I have this nice little family, two kids, a husband, and I'm always sneaking off to work on my artwork. And I felt like I was almost having an affair with my art. So I wrote all these letters to art, telling art secretly what I was thinking, what I was doing during the day, in my life and in my art. Here's some of them. This is one of them, one of the pages. That's the only one I'm showing you. But there were hundreds of them. Um, and I came back to starting to do these actually more recently, wondering if I was actually too old to still have an affair with art. I don't have any photos of it. Um, and part of it, actually, there's one little special series that's called Dear Art what I Die, When I Die, about uh, art and me and when I die. <laughs> In addition to those books, I did a lot of other artist books. These were a series of portable television books. They're made on paper, and they're um, pictures of portable televisions, mainly about things that happened outside the house, not on my house television. This one's called Let's Get Away. And the bottom lines say, let's get away. A vacation would do you some good. It says, we can't get away. Let's go home. This one's called Once Upon a Time. And it was during the news broadcast. I was out of town, and I taped it um, on television of when Princess Charles, I mean, Princess Diana and Charles got married. And I have the music and everything in the background. And the other, it has an audio tape. And, the audio tape says, once upon a time, will they live happily ever after? Please stay tuned. This is another book. The drawings that are on the bottom of the atomic bomb, my parents had um, a, me a medical book that was hanging around the house. And the last chapter of it was how you could beat the atomic bomb. And this was, I grew up in the 50s, and this was all from the 50s about building bomb shelters, having crackers and water in the basement and everything. So I took these pages out and all over it wrote, you couldn't. This is a book that, after doing these one-of-a-kind books, um, someone from the Visual Studies Workshop, Joan Lyons, if any of you know her, she's actually a wonderful artist herself, and she, with her husband, ran Visual Studies Workshop, Yearly, they would write a grant to try and get multiple books for artists. And they asked me if I wanted to be written into their grant. I said, sure. And um, this was my book. I got the grant. It's called This is a Test. And it's a story of five different cities around the world told in television news language 
about the dropping of a bomb in five different cities. And it's based on the phrase that they used to always say on the radio, this is a test, this was only a test. And the last page of it says, this was a test, you can see, had it been an actual emergency, and when you turn the page, it's all black. <coughs> black, sorry, <laughs> losing my voice. This was a, um, a window installation at Printed Matter, when it was on Lisbonad Street, based on the book, and it has the clock that's in the other room, actually one of the, um, one of the clocks about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and one of the pages from the book, blown up. In the early days, I started to do a series of clocks. I, I also like clocks, like televisions and f clothing. I like to use objects that we also that we also look at a lot, and clocks certainly are one of those objects. Um, these clocks are all based on the old saying, "Man works from sun to sun, but woman's work is never done." This is the first one I made. This is another clock about abortion rights. In the middle, the little print says, um, it's actually from Ro Roe v. Wade. Another one of the clocks from Hiroshima, time heals nothing. This is another one of the women's work. Clocks about health care. This clock is in the other room, and we all know what that's about. I did it almost 20, no, 30 years ago, still is nowhere near equal. This is another one of the clocks, it's about gun control. These three clocks are about AIDS. A lot of my friends were dying of AIDS at one point. Um, the clock on the left says all around it, my good friend died, the days were so long. The one on the right is about an article in 1989 about what the AIDS epidemic would look like in the year 2000. And the one in the middle is uh, from an article in Newsweek of photos of all the people who had died so far of AIDS, and it's called They All Died Before Their Time. Romance has passed. She spent too much time in the kitchen. This is a house where I, uh, at one point, I learned computer graphics, actually. Um, from someone at Rutgers. And in fact, I think this was shown somewhere at Rutgers at one point in a show called Retool. It was with Phil Ornstein, and who curated it. This is uh, one of the details. We had to learn Apple Basic. There were no graphics programs yet. That piece was in many shows, and it never seemed to work, so I decided to just go back to painting because it always worked. I made these little tiny paintings using error messages. I got lots of them because I was always making mistakes. And I love the language, actually. It was so untechnological. And these, I think of these little paintings, which there's some in the other room, as electronic needlepoint. My favorite one, if only you could. It's another book, it's an edition of 25. It tells a story in computer language, out of date of fatal error, press escape. And I also liked this book because it was an old way of printing, which was very heavy. Uh, it was done on a linotype, no, I forget, letterpress machine, and with um, new printing from an app, Apple Mac at the time. I started to add clothing to these pieces. This one's called Slave Ready Corporate. And all the error messages meant something as far as what the mistakes you were making. And Slave Ready meant you were ready to go into the network. I was questioning whether we really were ready to go into the corporate network, or maybe we should be doing something better. And on the clock it says, just a minute, please. This one's Slave Ready Maternal. The clock says, ready, willing, and able. And there's lots of pacifiers there. This one um, says Kill Level One, and the title of the piece is To Die For, which is the, a fashion comment done all the time. And it was done in basically about the war in Iraq, the first war in Iraq. These pieces are in the other room, and I thought of them as armor of some sort, coverings for an environmental catastrophe. 
This piece isn't there, but it's chaps. That piece is in the room. I remade the recycled coat for my show in 1994. Um, I've done a lot of paper doll dresses, and they all have to do with child abuse. They look like little paper dolls. They're about the size of a three-year-old's dress, and they hang very delicately on threads, and they're very vulnerable. They all have bows in the back, all those ribbons tie in the back, so if you turn around and look at the back of them, they have these little bows. The one on the left says she can't remember who did it. These are protectors against illness. There are three of them in the other room. And I was getting older. Lots of people I knew were getting ill, including people in my family. And I had remembered that some friend who lived next door had wore, wore a medal. It was a religious medal. And when I used to ask her what it was for, she told me it protected her against illness. So I decided to make clothes just like that, a talisman to protect us against illness. We could wear them and we wouldn't get sick. This is a red tamoxifen bra, like the black one in the other room, made out of tamoxifen pills from the day. And if you look at the black one, you notice the tamoxifen pills have little cameos in them. That's what the pills looked like at the time. Boxer shorts. A bikini made out of hospital masks. This piece is Nuclear Family. It's uh, another piece told in computer language, 10 home, 20 normal, 30 syntax error, and delete. And there are four garments for different people. This piece is in the, in the show, obviously. Biography, it's me. <laughs> on the left is me when I was young, and on the right is me now. More tailored, but still stuck with steel wool. In the late 90s, I started to knit babies again. This time, they weren't about personal things, but I had a granddaughter, so I decided to start knitting again. They were more about different ways of having a child, fertility, and just other subjects. <clears throat> I also did a lot of pieces where I carved soap. These two were in a show called Disappearing Acts. One thing was a thing that disappears quickly, like this. This was something that's very hard for it to disappear. And they were in the water, and they sort of melted away. Yeah. Uh, this is camouflage maternity dress done in response to hearing about a lot of women who were pregnant and serving in combat. And I remembered what it was like to be pregnant, and how vulnerable you feel, and how hard it is to hide. So I made the dress out of camouflage fabric, and this time it's black inside instead of white. Another piece, endangered species coat, made out of endangered species stuffed animals <laughs> that have been unstuffed. The back. You know what these are? These are the timelines. I started them um, around 2000, and I started them for a number of reasons. The first one I did was shoes. And at that time, my mother was old and sick. My, my uh, sister was actually quite ill. I had a lovely little granddaughter. And I couldn't wear the same shoes anymore. And I begin to realize that there are certain articles of clothing that change as you go through your life. And most women, they change for also, no matter what to do, no matter how well you keep yourself or you don't. Um, they just have a certain progression. And a lot of those shoes are shoes I have known and loved. The next one is underpants. Um, and it's from diapers to diapers with a couple of sexy things in the middle. And there's even my um, panty girdle. <laughs> and we probably none of us wear age-appropriate underwear, but that's the kind of underwear they used to wear. <laughs> the bras you can see in the other room. Um, this is a detail of the shoes. Underwear. Bras. This is, uh, these are a couple more timelines I've done. I've done a number of them. This is onesies. Nightgowns. It's a large piece. It's a little girl's nightgown. Hospital gown. Lacy number. This is one of my favorite pieces. It's called Rings, and it's about my mother's rings, actually. Um, the one on the left, I wear all the time. She gave it to me when I was a teenager because I was the only one that fit. Um, then there's an engagement ring, a wedding ring, and the one on the right is a 
a wedding ring on a chain. And when my mother was older and lived in senior housing, I asked her why they all had their wedding rings on the chain, and she said, because some of them have gotten too fat, and some of them have gotten too skinny, and none of them can wear it on their fingers. I made this piece after 9-11, although it took me a long time to finish it, and I lived not far from the World Trade Center, and this was the color of the people's skin when they were walking up the street, all covered in ash. Uh, this is about, it could be either about nine months of pregnancy or done at a time when Octomom was in fashion, and so I made nine. This little piece is a little dress out of camouflage fabric. I had a house up, I still have a house upstate, and I noticed people grow the most beautiful flowers and they put them all in cages, and I thought, this is what we do to our daughters. This is another timeline piece. Socks, detail. This is the book I was talking about from 1965. The thing on the top uh, were my earrings for the city while I was doing my um, uh, archiving with, uh, with one of the archivists who actually published the book, uh, Denise Schatz. She has a little company called Miniature Garden. Uh, we found the pictures, and I was amazed because I didn't think I still had them. And the two dresses on the bottom are two dresses that I made, the ones that I wanted to surround myself, and I would be the armature. This is a, a fairly new piece. It's quite new, actually. I've started to make clothes out of clothes I made as clothes. Um, and this dress, my mother had it. I didn't even know it still existed. But I had made it while I was at Mass Art. And when my mother died, I found it in her house. It says on it, and they all say words. They're kind of almost like a funny diary. As a child, I loved to draw. Because of this, I decided to go to art school. I made this dress for a project in a design class that required printing on fabric. My teacher in this class was the only female teacher that was in my six years of graduate and undergraduate study. That same year, I was in a drawing class the drawing teacher told me that I was the best draftsman in the class, but he said he didn't have to worry about me. I was going to get married and have two kids, and that would be the end of me. Once, years later, I wondered how he knew. These are new pieces I'm making called Armor for Any Eventuality. They were sort of inspired by inheriting all my mother's silverware, and I thought, silverware, I can make armor, and this is one of the first ones I made using one of the spoons. This is the last slide, and one of the pieces it uses scrubbers, <laughs> new kinds of scrubbers, and um, there are dust masks for the bra pots. And that is it. <laughs> hmm? Yes. Does it? <laughs> quick, quick. I didn't really do much of anything. Um, I mean, people would come to see my work. At the beginning, it, it, was, it was problematic. I, I would show them the clothes, and I would give my little theory about sculpture and this and that and a visual object, and, and nobody got it. They didn't understand what I was talking about. They thought, well, it was too much like fashion, or perhaps it was theater design, or maybe they were costumes. So what I did in response was I didn't show them to anyone. And I showed them to very, very few people, actually, who came to my studio after that. Um, I was starting to do different things anyways. I was doing all these big drawing installations. So I just never showed them to anyone except the people that I thought would understand them and like them. And um, one of the people that I showed them to was Judith Tannenbaum, who came to my studio. She was doing a show. This is when she was at the Friedman Gallery at Friedman College, I think. No, it wasn't. It was 
Yes, the Doris Friedman Gallery. It was in a college in Pennsylvania, I forget the name of it. It starts with an A. Um, anyways, so she put in, the, she, was, she wanted things about everyday life, and she put in the whole, uh, one of the television news drawings, the big ones that stick out, and um, Home Sweet Home, and I liked her and thought she would understand them, so I showed her the clothes. And I did that with a number of people, but um, years later in the 90s, when young artists were starting to make clothes, she was already at the ICA in Philadelphia. She said to me, this is nuts. Nobody knows about these clothes. <laughs> so I had a retrospective of those pieces then. Um, and after that, I showed them a fair amount. But I, I never really showed them. I know that they were being shown as slides you know, to feminist groups and things. But it was just, I was quiet and shy, and it was too much. I just couldn't be bothered arguing with people, to be perfectly honest. I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about what the faculty um, response to your um, MFA show about wedding dress was. Um, all the faculty were men, right? Everyone, yeah, they were all men. Um, no one said anything to me about it at all. Years later, um, Ann Goodyear told me she thought it was the best show she'd ever seen. Uh, I, I used to, I, I lived in New York actually while I was a student here. And sometimes I would stay overnight with friends that lived in um, New Brunswick. But often I went back and forth. In fact, I often went back and forth on the bus with uh, Jeff Hendricks. <laughs> and um, after I finished my penoir, which wasn't really in the show, I brought it out to some kind of a critique. We had all these people come for critiques. I remember one, in fact, uh, I recently showed this to Judith Stein, because in my, in my diary it says, Leo Steinberg and Dick Bellamy are coming for critiques today. Now, I don't know if this was the day I brought my penoir, but I used to bring the clothes out periodically. I had a big blue box that I had bought a coat with from Bloomingdale's and I would put the pieces in there and I'd bring them out and I'd hold them up and nobody ever said a word. <laughs> and frankly, I didn't care because nobody ever said a bad word either. You know, I just brought them home. I, 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 I did what I wanted. I didn't really care what they said. I wasn't making it for them. I was making it really for myself, I felt. I've always felt that way. I mean, there's no other perk you get from making this stuff except making it really, the only guaranteed perk anyways. So um, I just, I didn't really care. I put them back in the box and we'd take them home. <laughs> no one said anything. Yes, she has talked to me. Okay. Yes, so, I, and that's kind of I know. Fall and yeah. Yeah. But can you talk about, you know, the women's community and who is around you and whether you felt bolstered by that or that didn't make much of a difference? Well, I, Rutgers at that time was just a really unusual place. And everyone was going their own way and doing their own things. And I don't think. It mattered to anyone what anyone else did, honestly. Um, people were interested in everything everyone did, really. It was almost like people were searching to try and find new things to do. We had all these people coming out, uh, showing us things that I couldn't have possibly imagined, to be perfectly honest, after coming from mass art. I mean, I remember some things that were absolutely spectacular. In fact, I told someone about this the other day. Um, I think it was Robert Morris, but it might have even been Bob Watts in the gallery. Uh, Lucinda Childs came with um, James Byers and just did a little dance around a huge light bulb. And I'd never seen anything like that. There was just, for us, 10 graduate students. Uh, nobody was, um, everyone was supportive in their own way. I, I knew Jackie Windsor a bit, because she had gone to Mass Art, and she was a year behind me. Um, 
Nobody, you know, at, at that time, no one really talked about women's issues, I have to tell you. Uh, it, it was never discussed. It was, no, this wasn't, it wasn't discussed really much anywhere. Uh, you know, I mean, I think the feminine mystique came out around them, but I didn't read it until later. But um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't discussed. And I thought of my work, um, although it was very feminist, it really came out of this avant-garde thing that I could do anything I wanted. And there was Robert Morris. And not only could I do anything I wanted, I could, I could have a theory for it. I mean, I could have a reason for it. That's why I kept thinking I had this little theory. He was the first artist I'd ever met who was somewhat intellectual, you know. So here was, here was Robert Morris, and here was, and I kind of kept by myself a lot. Joan was doing a funny little thing, too. She was doing some kind of an angel thing. Um, and I was, I was the only person who made clothes, except for one thing. Um, one year, uh, one of the people that came for critique was um, Ben Barillo from Beyond Keeney Gallery. And he liked my clothes a lot and asked me if I would come in. And I was, that was when I was doing the plastic dresses, I think. If I would come in um, and, and show them to him. And I showed them to them. And they wanted to do a pop art fashion show. And I threw out my little theory about how this was sculpture, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't want people wearing them because they, they might smell. In fact, not only, you know, they, they weren't really made to fit anyone. And I probably, everyone knows this story, but maybe not everyone in this room. Um, and um, then the next year, I went to an uh, opening of Bianchini Galley with uh, Kisoni and Ali Rahman for sure. Bob Watson, there was. Bob Watts had made some plastic dresses. And um, so they never said much of anything, really and truly. In fact, it was at a panel where, that I was on with Jackie and Jeff. And someone in the audience asked me if I was inspired by Bob making the dresses. And Jackie actually got adamant and said, he was inspired by her. You know, it was, no one said anything. When I graduated, this is one thing that happened. Bob Watts called me. Um, and, and, and some of the boys went directly into big galleries, but he called me and said to me, I'm going to be talking at a local church, women's group, and could I show a picture of your clothes? <laughs> it was just, it was, it, the two things didn't mix. You know, the girl, everyone knew that girls were not the same in the art world. In fact, today, we were at a, uh, Connie was talking about, um, we knew in the back of our heads. We knew that girls only got somewhere in a certain way, but they never got to the same place. But Connie was talking about um, Linda Nochlin's article. Mm -hmm. And for me, I remember reading that, and that was an eye-opener, because I had never really totally verbalized the fact that I had never heard of any women artists. Mm -hmm. And yet, here I was, went, you know, to become a woman artist. Um, it was a totally, totally different time. There's no way you can compare that to now. It, it, it just was a totally, totally different time. And I said this to a class, um, I'll say one sentence, but um, this was the 60s when I started to make these things. And, and the 60s in itself were a different time. And people had this strange idea that art could cure things, that art would somehow make the world better, even. and. Um, you know, it was a different kind of, everyone who was an artist thought of themselves as part of a counterculture, but there was no, no feminist thing, nothing about women or men, even though in fact the reality was that the women were not really anywhere and the men were over there. Uh, that's the way it was. <laughs> I don't know what to say other than that. <laughs> Thank you very much.